Let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you have not only shown us the sight that comes through your Son, but that you have healed us, that you have allowed us to see Jesus as the ultimate revelation of God in our world. In your name we pray. Amen. So, it called, and then it hung up. So I don't know what's going on. Anyway. Everyone should have a sheet. If you need a Bible, there are Bibles in the back. Do you have one already, or would you like someone to grab one? You have one? Okay. Everyone else have one? Okay. All right, we are going to be in Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, our verse of the day. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, that by, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Let's try this again. Okay, well, I can hear you now. I can hear you now too. I can hear you before. Okay. Uh, the verse, though, is good because when we start getting into chapter 2, we do still carry over some of the themes of chapter 1, but the difference now is we're actually getting into how Christ's suffering is actually part of the very glory that we have in Him as the Son of God. Okay? And so, quick review. Who wrote the letter to the Hebrews? No. The man named Anonymous, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't know who wrote it. We've got several theories. It could have been Paul. It could have been one of Paul's apostles. It might have even been one of the earliest church fathers. We don't know, though. Um, however, it has been included in the Bible because of the power of its words and the use that it's been used with within the Christian church from very early times. Okay? Uh, the what, we've already kind of mentioned, Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. That's kind of the what and the why of the letter of Hebrews. What about the when? What's a good time frame for when we think this was written? 70 AD or what? Yeah, most likely before 70 AD. So a lot of, a lot of people like to put it between 50 and 70 AD. Why? Because he talks about the temple and the, te and the sacrificial system in the letter, kind of like it's ongoing. That being said, there are some that say it could have been written as late as 90 AD, uh, depending on, again, who you put the author as. Okay, and the where. Yes. But, a lot of times, especially Paul, he writes about things in kind of uh, almost an illustrative manner where he talks about it like, oh, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about this person or this system. And so it's, it's real hard to be definitive because you don't know if he's maybe just alluding to something that is familiar to them even though they also know that this sacrificial system was destroyed in around 70 AD. Yeah, so it's hard. But that is the main reason why most people try to put it before 70 AD. Yeah. So when the temple was destroyed, did the Jews just give up on their religion? Well, it's really interesting. Because you'll notice there is no temple in the same sense right now. The Jewish religion after the destruction of the temple became very interesting. Because it's a religion without its, or its original form of forgiveness. And so the now, temple, they had the tabernacle, which I guess was like a substitute. But regardless, though, all of those things were there for the purpose of sacrifice. Right. So and they could have atonement, so they could have forgiveness, right? And so when the temple got destroyed, they kind of have been adrift for the past almost 2,000 years now. Um, and so the Jewish religion is very, it's just from a purely human perspective, it's very interesting because it's a religion that is based upon basically uh, upholding the traditions and continuing in God's word. The other parts that haven't been kind of taken from them, they haven't built the temple back. 
even though that is on the, the, the dreams of many, many people, um, but they've never built it back. And so they've continued a religion without a means of atonement. You know who all those sacrifices are? No, they can't. And, and because they don't have the... Yeah, according to their religion, it's wrong to sacrifice outside of the temple. I mean, that's again and again the Bible. You know, this king was a good king, but he didn't remove the high places. Right? And that was saying that they were sacrificing to Yahweh on the high places sometimes when it says they, they were doing that. But they weren't supposed to be. It was only supposed to be a sacrificial system done by the Levitical priests, specifically the, the family of Aaron, and at the place God designated. Originally the tabernacle, later the temple. Do you think they might have touched on that to sacrifice? Is there something else on the temple now? The temple mount is actually a, the, the, it's a Muslim yeah. mosque now. Yeah. The, dome the, the, the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. The, the only thing left of the original temple is what is it, is the west wall? Yeah. 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 And so they go to the west wall and they'll put like prayers in the cracks of the wall and stuff. Yeah. You have another question, Julie? Well, is there a scripture that we're the temple that we're gonna have the temple again? I think kind of like Well, is. yes and no. The temple will come back, but who's our temple now? Jesus. Jesus. Exactly. And so the temple of God is God mm-hmm. dwelling among us. Well, who is God dwelling among us? It's Jesus. We don't need a building or a, a you know a representation of God's presence on earth anymore. We've got the real thing. Yeah. Sometimes we're called the temple. You know, that he because God dwells in you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And then really throw all sorts of things. We're also the the, the body of Christ too, right? And so who? So is Christ still dwelling on earth through us yeah. right now? Yeah. Yeah. In a in a physical sense through us. Mm-hmm. You know, in kind of a, a spiritual and visible sense, he's dwelling where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am also, right? That's harder for us physical creatures to really take comfort in though. That's why he gave us the Lord's Supper as a physical means of his presence among us, right? Uh, and so I'm not saying he isn't here. He's God. He's literally everywhere. He's omnipresent. But at the same time, in our limited state, that's harder for us to, to, to take comfort in. And so he's given us other means, like the sacrament, like worship, like all these other things, to take comfort in his presence. Yeah. So, the where. <laughs> If we make it past the when. What about the where? Where geographically do we have some association with this letter? Italy one. Yeah. Yeah. With the Roman with the most likely the church in Rome or at least the, the Italian peninsula, right? Uh, the reason we can say that is at the end of the letter he talks about, you know, Rome. And there's a debate back and forth of whether he's saying he's writing to the people of Rome or he's writing from Rome to other people. Um, again, my take on it is that he is away from Rome with some Romans near him and sending their greeting back to Rome, or at least that peninsula. That's my take on it. Again, there are other interpretations on that one. Okay. Any questions on the who, what, when, where, and why review? All right, let's get on. What's going on here? The writer to the Hebrews reminds us that Jesus entered into glory through suffering. This suffering included his death, as this passage reminds us, as well as the physical abuse that led to it. It also included the suffering of his temptation and the pain of being rejected by his own people. Jesus helps us resist the temptation to view our suffering as a cruel punishment from God. Our high priest empowers us to gain a new perspective on life. A perspective that believes God helps us in our weakness. And suffering reminds us that we are merely human and are waiting for the day when we will be transformed and enter into the new heaven and new earth where there will be no more sorrow or pain. Okay? Now let's read. 
Beginning chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little, for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. <laughs> now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, because of the suffering of death, so that, by, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he who for, who for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children of God have... Behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. I know ambitious of me to put 18 verses. But <laughs> what are your thoughts off of it right off the top? Well, one of the things that struck me is in quoting those quotations, mm -hmm. it showed that at that time they regarded that as the word of God. Oh, yeah. Which is not the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very much so, yeah. And, he, and you really look at it, Jesus himself quoted the Old Testament all over the place. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Okay. Well, let's start off. Verse 1. Therefore, we. Who are you talking about? Us, yeah. The people he's writing to, yeah. Who else is included in we? Himself. Think about that. Think about most of the time when Paul's admonishing someone, he usually admonishes them, and occasionally he'll include himself in that admonishment. Here, though. Throughout the letter of Hebrews, the author almost universally includes himself in all the admonishments, in all of the encouragements. Therefore, we, meaning he himself as well, must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Okay? In other words, hey, this is valuable, important stuff. Remember what we've been talking about up to this point. Chapter 1, you know, we're comparing Jesus to the angels and how much superior he is to the angels and how they really don't hold a candle. They're just mere messenger boys for God, who is Jesus, right? And now he says, think of me about all of that, this, these glorious revelations of God's word in our lives. We must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. In other words, hey guys, this isn't just out there for no reason, right? You need this. This is here to anchor you to solid ground or to anchor you at a fixed point. Okay? This term drift away, this is the only time it's used in the entire New Testament, by the way. Okay? 
this word implies that a drifting away, like a, literally a boat left without an anchor, or a boat taken by a river or a current, it's just without guidance, without direction, it's just going. Right? Okay? If that's, that's us if we don't pay attention to God's word, to God's revealed word. Okay? It's us. It's us. Because we have to pay attention. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly, right? It is us. I would say when. Because there are times where we do, we do pay attention yeah. to God's word. You know? But, I agree. <laughs> when, right? When. Uh huh. Oh, wait. Jesus has got this. I don't have to worry about this anymore. Yeah. yeah. Well, then. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, exactly. It's like, just because Jesus fulfilled the law doesn't mean that the law doesn't still weigh upon us, right? Just because Jesus is the divine revelation of God's word doesn't mean that we ourselves aren't held to that same word. Right? Yeah. yeah. And it says that you don't change one jot or tittle until mm-hmm. the heavens and earth go away. So that's yeah. the entire of all generations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Coming back to the book of Revelation there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's still the new coming Well, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm saying it's from the <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. Okay? Uh, again, the word angels here, it can be translated as messengers or as angelic beings. The word is generic. It just simply means messengers. And so here, yes, they translate it as, as angels because the previous comparison was angels. But, in those previous comparisons, there were also some prophets, too. So you can't understand this as, uh, for since the message declared by the messengers proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, okay? Thinking, then, about this idea of a just retribution, what are we talking about? What is the just retribution to this message? Well, maybe he's talking about the fall of the sin. Where God said, Who's this? And I haven't said anything. <laughs> and so the retribution was that all the problems, death and the punishment that we received. Yeah. You go to see each other. Yeah. Yeah. This just retribution so, is, is not only death in this life, but eternal death in the life to come, right? Yeah. This is scary stuff. Yes. Got to remember, at this point, there really wasn't the New Testament yet. Potentially, Paul's letters, maybe the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Matthew, but that's only you know, like even that wouldn't have been shared amongst the whole church yet. Just the people who were the select you know congregations who got those wonderful works, right? Okay. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. How shall we escape? What's the answer to this question? No. No. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great... Yeah. Exactly, right? You're not going to escape. Remember what we just talked about? You know, sin, death, hell, damnation, right? If you neglect the salvation given to you, where does that leave you? In the just retribution. Good luck with that. Have fun. <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, while God also, or sorry, it was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard Excuse me. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Okay. To get a little bit more perspective on this, let's first look up 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12. Verses 6 through 12. Okay. We're talking about 
the testimony, okay? Remember, he's talking about, hey, we've received this testimony, we've received this, this witness, okay? And so John here explains a little bit about that. Where he says in chapter 5, verse 6, can someone read it? 6 through 12, chapter 5. Or, yes, yes, chapter 5. I was like, no, no, it's chapter 1. It's 1 John. 1 John, chapter 5, verse 6 through 12. 1 John. I think I said John, yeah. I did say 1 John. Okay, yeah. 1 John, chapter 5, verse 6 through 12. Can someone read it? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are these, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Okay. So thinking about this now, mm-hmm. God also bore witness, right? Not only through his Son, but then through the apostles and the prophets, right? Through all of the Old Testament prophets, through the angels in the Old Testament, through the angels in the New Testament, right? All of these things bore witness to the truth. And what is the truth? That life is found only in Jesus, right? And so, when we look at this, you know, again, the author of Hebrews is trying to make a, almost a, a, an argument for the sake of Jesus, saying, hey, guys, look at all this stuff. If you, if you believe that angels are real, if you believe that the Bible is God's word, if you've done all of this, then the only conclusion you can come to then is that Jesus is, as he put it here, right? Your great salvation. It's just saying, there's no other thing you can do. And John's saying the same thing, you know? The testimony is through the Spirit and the truth, through the blood and the water, through God himself concerning his Son. Again, there's no other conclusion. There's no other way you can go with this. What was C.S. Lewis's famous three ways of putting this? Jesus either had to be a liar, a lunatic, or a lord. Right? Because C.S. Lewis pointed out, hey, you have to, the, the words themselves are there. So either Jesus said these words and was just lying through his teeth, or he believed them and was just an utter lunatic, or he's the Lord of all the universe. What makes that more powerful is knowing that he was trying to disprove Jesus when he did all of that. He ended up proving to himself that Jesus was real. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah. C.S. Lewis did not start out a Christian. Mm -hmm. He was an adult convert. You think there was some heresy like against that going on at the time of the Britain? As far as the Hebrews goes? Yeah. I think the, the author isn't dealing with heresy so much as he's trying to work through that Hebrew audience. Mm-hmm. Remember, you got a lot of Jews in the synagogues throughout the Roman Empire who are still saying, this Jesus guy isn't who he says he was, right? He was a liar, or he was a lunatic. Or, you know, they would have considered him a heretic, right? That's why they put him to death. You know? The difference being, though, hey, look at the Old Testament. Look at the Scripture. Look at the Revelation. Look at the testimony. This should 
leads you to the one final conclusion that Jesus is Lord, right? That He is your great salvation. All right. So thinking about all this now, what evidence do you see of drifting and neglect in the church today? And that God still preserves his church. Say it again? Well, God still preserves his church. He still preserves his church, yes. Mm-hmm. But... We should have a lot of churches of convenience crowded up. Okay. A lot of Bibles of convenience crowded up. We have a lot of scattering of the flock going on mm-hmm. under the guise of this is a building of God. Uh, this is a book of God. Uh, we have a lot of scattering of the flock. Yeah. Yeah. We even have made up religions. Well, yeah. Now, guys disguising themselves as, oh, we're the church. Yeah. Which churches in town are actually churches? Which ones are storefronts? Corporations. Yeah. It can be a challenge, right? Social. Yes. <laughs> or social clubs, yeah. yeah. Let's look at Second Timothy. This isn't a new problem. Okay? You got it? Second Timothy 3, 1 through 9. But what if there will be terrible times in the last days? People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash. And keep it. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of God in life, but denying his power. Have nothing to do with it. Yeah, say stop and I. Julie's like, what about that? That's the next question. You can't get into that. You can't get into Second Timothy three and not get into that next ten through seventeen, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead and finish through nine. They are the kind who run their way into homes and gain control over weak women. Are loaded down with sin and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. Just as Janice and Janice opposed to Moses, so also these men oppose the truth. They are men of depraved mind, who, as far as the faith is concerned, Rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, they're following the spirit of everyone. You guys see some of this? Right? Yeah. How can you not see, right? Yeah. It's, all it's all over, right? I mean, this is pretty characteristic of the world today, right? And is it a good thing? No, right? This is a bad thing. This is not what we want the world to be like. And yet, God tells us, this is what we're going to be dealing with. This is the reality of his church on earth. Is we're going to be dealing with this. Um, it is kind of funny. Uh, I had a professor who he likes to say, the church is full of sinners, and we need more of them. Because <laughs> it is true. Like, you know, you might, we might try to lift ourselves up and say, oh, we're not this, we're not that. But you really dig down to it to the standard of perfection that Jesus laid before us, and we start chipping away real fast at our own innocence in these paths, right? All right. Especially us weak-willed women. (laughs) Weak-willed women. He's talking about trying to protect women here. He's not demeaning women. That's like the my, my wife hates it when an author will, will use, you know, like child abuse or you know, things like that to demonstrate the evil of the bad character in the story. And it's like it's meant to be bad. He's trying to demonstrate how bad this person is. He's not saying this is a good thing. It's too bad. It's too bad. Alright. Now, let's flip the coin. What evidence do you see that God still preserves his church 
despite our drifting and neglect. You want to read the, the 10 through 17 for us, Julie? You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering. What kinds of things happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and life that the persecution that I endured? Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that's one Yeah. So, what evidence do you see that God still preserves His church despite our drifting and neglect? We wouldn't be here at all. Yeah. Wow. We wouldn't be here at all, right? What, is, what are each of you holding in your hand as evidence of God still preserving His church, right? The rule and norm of our faith, right? The Bible God gave us to help us from drifting away, right? You know, we were just talking about how in the Jewish church there's no temple. Mm-hmm. And until I read this verse, it occurred to me, well, the Jewish people are kind of dopey. Why don't they get a new temple? They can build synagogues all over everything. they got a whole country full. they got an iron dome of I don't know what all that stuff is. They spend money. they got money. They do stuff. Why not build a temple? Well, here's an evidence of perhaps why we can see God's hand at work. He didn't allow them. It hasn't occurred to them, apparently. Oh, it's occurred to them. Oh, it's definitely, there's whole sects within Judaism that are convinced that they're the ones to bring back the temple. But they didn't do it. And I'm wondering if maybe God has not allowed them to do it because the temple is among us. And there's no need to build another temple. And he's quite made it impossible to build a temple because obviously it hasn't happened very much. Yes. Yes. Besides that, the building of the rock is his one was when they make our top and to give them out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you know, you'd have to tear that down yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. 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 You you could argue from a Jewish perspective, it almost has to. Um, the reason I say that Solomon's temple was built on the same land according to Jewish tradition where Abraham tried to offer up his son Isaac. Yeah. And God provided a, a lamb to be sacrificed, right? Or a ram in that case to be sacrificed. Uh, that's according to tradition. It is the same spot. And it ends up being the same threshing floor later on as well. And so it's this spot seems to take on significance geographically for the Israelites as well. So I don't know that they would approve building the temple somewhere else. What is the threshing for? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to remember the full story. It said uh, when uh, the Philistines stole the ark and then it came back uh, led by the, the un, untethered, unled oxen or whatever it was, mm-hmm. it stopped at so and so's threshing floor. Okay. And so they kept it there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't until, I don't remember, it, it did get moved, and then when they pr- tried to bring it back, they're like, uh oh. And that's when David had the problem of uh, they tried to cart the ark back instead of carrying it like God commanded them to. And someone tried to balance it, steady it. Mm-hmm. God struck him dead. And, yeah. Say again. Yeah. That was a, that was a, yeah. Well, yeah, so. I'm kind of thinking even that Christians are putting too much stock into a building. Like when you go to Europe, these beautiful cathedrals and these buildings, and and even here in in America, we build these beautiful buildings, and yet we feel like, well, this is God's house, this is holy, you know, it's, it's special, but yet that's not what the church is. It's not the building. We've lost sight of why we built the buildings, right? Yeah. We yeah. built the buildings for convenience. 
Yeah. Convenient place to gather, right? The church itself, you know, that word just means assembly, a, a, a gathering of people. But um, even in my own heart, I saw a picture of a, it looks like it used to be a beautiful church with stained glass in the front, and arch high, beautiful ceilings, and it was a bar. It was a high class bar. Yeah. And that just hurt me. I mean, but I, I have to get over that, I guess, because it was just a building. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting story. What's the fastest growing church in the world right now? Probably the Muslim <laughs> Muslims not a church. Fastest growing oh. church. Yeah. Christian church. Yeah. Mormons are not a church. Oh. Mormons are in a cult. They don't believe in the Trinity. <laughs> They can call themselves all they want. They're not a church. <laughs> fastest growing church on the planet is Africa. Oh, oh yeah, right. It's right. Africa. There are more Lutherans. Not even talking about all yeah, the other right. right. There are more Lutherans in Africa than the LTMS, ELCA, and Wells combined. That's right. Times two. That's right. Wow. Well, maybe even in one country. In I mean, one country, there are over five million Lutherans. I don't remember. Yeah, right. yeah. I don't remember Kenya Nigeria. or Nigeria or which one. Uh, but where do they meet? Outdoors. Whatever tree is convenient to gather around. Seriously, their church building is oftentimes the nicest, best shade tree in the area, and they'll pack a thousand people around that tree for their worship service. You want to talk about the church not worrying about buildings? Go look at the African church. They're sending missionaries back to us now. Right, right. So we need more global warming here. (laughs) 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 I have. I've been in Fargo, North Dakota, for eight years. And I had a number of uh, refugees that came through the United Nations refugee camp from Africa to Fargo, North Dakota. And many of my refugee students were Lutheran, and they were amazing. Yeah. So even within my own seminary class, the, the way they, they their ordination process is a little simpler than ours. We're so focused on education here that we often cut some people out because of that. But what they do though is they you know ordain through whatever system of education they have there, and then after you're ordained, they'll send you here to the states to get your advanced degree at the seminaries here in the states. And then you go back, and then you then are the professor at the you know the institutions there to ordain more pastors and to to, to keep the system going. And so just within my class, I don't even know. There is five or six, maybe more. I don't know. That was many ones I interacted with was the ones that ate lunch where I ate lunch, which was upstairs in one of the student centers. Because uh, they would always have their, they'd be using the, the kitchens in there making stuff. And it was always incredible what they could put together. Like, they had this cornmeal recipe that I just wanted to have it every time they made it. And I'm like, what are you guys coming up with here? It really made a mess of dishes, but it looked amazing. Uh, but yeah, and so there's all sorts of, you know, things like that. Um, I don't even know where we got to. Oh, this is God preserving the church, right? Yeah, that's right. Let's, uh, any other questions on verses 1 through 4? Or can we move to, to verse 5 now? All right, let's, let's keep moving then. Sorry, I'm getting way off. Um, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower, for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Okay. Here's one of those big words that people don't like in the New Testament. This word, subjected, or submission. Same word. Okay. Here, though, it's the, in the Greek, it's, it's an active form of the verb. In other words, this is actually implying a sense of forced Submission, subjugated. Okay, it was not the angels that God subjugated the world to come. 
Okay? Or even in, in the, the quotation from Psalm 8 here in verse 8, put everything in subjugation, you know, under his feet. So putting in everything in subjection or subjugating everything to him, he left nothing outside his control. Okay? Notice the difference and the distinction with the other famous time where this is often used, Ephesians chapter 5. What does that one say? Ephesians 5, 21 through 24. Submit out of reverence. Yeah. This is the, the famous wives, submit to your own husbands, right? Well, it doesn't actually say submit there. That's implied by the previous verse. You gotta start at verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Um, and he and he and his sorry, head of the church, his body and his himself as Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit and everything to their husbands. This is not the active form of the verb. It's the passive form of the verb. Notice the contrast, the tone that these two verses are talking about. In here, whose job is it to make someone submit in the Ephesians verse? The person themselves. Yeah, it's the wives themselves, right? This is a voluntary submission. That's the passive form of the verb. The husbands aren't making their wives submit. Christ doesn't make the church submit to him. No. When Paul talks about Ephesians, this is a voluntary submission. This is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, hey, because we adore Christ, because we love Christ, we, we emulate Him. He submitted Himself to God the Father. He submitted Himself for our sake. Now think about how much of a change that is when you put this into the past, into the active form, like it is here in Hebrews. That angels that God subjugated to man and to Jesus, right? That's again the author of Hebrews is trying to make a point. He's trying to make a point that Jesus is superior. That even man is superior to angels in a certain respect. Okay. Getting now into verses six to eight. Okay, he's quoting from Psalm 8. Let's look at verse at Psalm 8 and let's see a little bit more about what David is actually doing. I think it's funny. He's like, it has been testified somewhere. Now, this is David, Psalm 8. He knows exactly who it is. He's just, you know, not trying to show off. <laughs> so, Psalm 8. Yeah, we're singing, right? It's almost hard to read that first verse and not sing. Yeah. Oh Lord, our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength, because of thine enemy, thou, that thou mightest skill the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So, the author of Hebrews here is quoting these as being relevant to Jesus. But in what ways are these verses also true for all of mankind? Well, we have set man above all the creatures and all the things. We said creation is 
So God created us, right? He created us in His image. I think the easiest and most literal way of understanding that is the context of the verse. God put us in charge of His creation, just like He Himself is in charge of His creation. Right? All creation around us is subject to man coming, right? Why? Because God ordained it. Not because we're more clever, although you could argue we are. Not because we use tools, although you could argue we do. Not because of our you know, massive brain capacity, although you could argue that's potentially true as well. Exactly. None of that, though, is the reason why. The reason why is because God ordained it. He told us, do this. He said, I need man to take care and tend for my garden. Yeah. And we're doing my job. Yeah. <laughs> Before the fall, maybe. <laughs> and then there's the further. That's the second half of this question, right? In what way is Psalm 8 fulfilled in Jesus now? Because he is the he is all of mankind reduced to one, right? He is the pinnacle of you know what man should be, right? And he restores God's creation back to the glory, to the heavenly host, to all of it that it's supposed to be, right? And so this is again one of those prophetic psalms where it has two fulfillments. Right? It's fulfilled in mankind, but it's ultimately fulfilled in Christ. Yeah. Acting as Christ, isn't that the only way we can actually have true dominion over this? Acting as Christ? Yeah. In a sense, yeah. To act as Christ? yeah. In fact, uh, there's a there's a, a theological term I'm called just to control Well, yeah, in a sense. Uh, in, in fact, the, you, if you get into theological terms, the, the term of you know, redeeming creation, which we talked about in, the, in one of our online Bible studies, gets on this entire thing. How we in and ourselves are part of that restoration of creation. Our curing of sicknesses, our healing of the blind, our you know, restoring the earth and the planet to you know, a harmonious balance. Are, you know, all these different things. We actually, until Christ comes and is the final fulfillment of it, we are Christ on earth. We are actually partaking in his restoration of creation right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yeah, as as, as uh, Walt put it, if, if we're doing it according to Christ's design and it's subjection to him, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Because as, as the psalmist says, right, um, you have put all things under his feet. Well, that also includes us, right? We are part of Christ's subject, even though you, know, you can also say we ourselves have the you know, earth under our feet and our, our, our dominion over it. But, yeah, this is, it's one of those, there's greater fulfillment, again, in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on the, the blessed and what way the psalm is fulfilled in Jesus, and with the, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic, so excellent is your name in all the earth, and it, it kind of goes with, uh, there was something I didn't get a full answer last week, and Hebrews 1 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of the king, sustaining all things by a powerful word. Mm -hmm. you know, so Jesus comes to us in the same as how he just spoke the word and mm -hmm. things were made and, and yeah. all of that. So yeah. our, our, which is interesting, our actual creator died for us. Again, it blows our limited mind, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. How can the creator die for his, as part of his creation? What? <laughs> Yeah, but no, but it's still true, though, right? And then the, the right, the image there is the, the radiance of the sun, right? 
Yeah. Again, you can't take that analogy too far or else you end up in, as a heretic. But if you think of the rays of the sun as being the sun itself, right? God himself is also the rays. You know, and so it's, it's a powerful image to think about the word of God doing these things. The son of God, you know, doing these things. Yeah. No, in the Old Testament they read, first of all, the Old Testament they read Psalm 8. Mm -hmm. And it sounds very much like he's talking about mankind as the stewards of the earth. Mm -hmm. In Hebrews, they take this further, the author, and says specifically in verse 9 that it's Jesus that we are the stewards of the earth. Which is a fulfillment of this messianic foreshadowing. Yep. How, how many people in the Old Testament do you think understood that at the time? Or was that like the disciple point to a as was needed to have their mind I think a lot of a lot of these were already understood as messianic prophecies. I don't know about this one specifically. There are little parts about it though that make you really wonder the son of man that you care for him. When they use that term son of man, that often implies something even greater than just your average human. Mm -hmm. And many times the Hebrew, the, the Jews would take that as specific to the future Davidic king or even more specifically to the future restoration the person who would restore you know, Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And so that one in and of itself has a little bit of hint in there. The other one that would, that I would uh, have a hard time not being able to say it is as well. In the verse six, you put all things under his feet. You know, this. You know, you have given him dominion over the works of hands. You put all things under his feet. Yes, man kind of does fulfill that, but at the same time, it's really hard to say that all things are within our control. You know, and so it's. It, there's a little bit more happening here than just your average person, which is why, again, you see this, this kind of double fulfillment. Mankind, as you pointed out, but ultimately, you know, Christ. Do you think the Jewish teachers of the Old Testament times and around Jesus kind of understood any of that? I think Son of Man, yes. Uh, uh, the, especially once you get to Daniel, it's very specific, not Daniel. I, think it's, I can't remember which book. Uh, the word Ezekiel. Ezekiel, yeah. Son of Man is very much. This is not just your person. This is this is something bigger. Okay. Yeah. yeah. God refers to Ezekiel as Son of Man. He calls him that mm -hmm. frequently. But at the same time, in Ezekiel, he talks about the Son of Man. There's this greater fulfillment, and the, they very much took this as this is the Messiah that 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 God's prophetically talking about. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Son of man, can these bones live? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that is Jesus as well, but because of Jesus, he crowned him with glory and honor. We've been crowned with glory and honor. You know, keep the glory in the midst of our heads. Uh, that's kind of where it's going to be. Well, we are the, you could even say we are the crown of God's creation, <laughs> but we disposed our, or we deposed ourselves, right? And so it took Jesus to crown mankind as God's, to, uh, to re crown mankind for God, right? And so you think about it, when God created us, we were the crown of his creation. Mm -hmm. We deposed ourselves, we fell from, you know, from, from grace. It fell from glory, and it did. It took Jesus to restore that position, to restore man to where we should be, and as God created us to be. Okay. Within all of this, okay, when we talk about you know putting everything in subjection, there is a very strong allusion to this idea of now and not yet. This is very true now, but it has not yet reached its final fulfillment. Okay. And so in verses 8 and 9, you really see this. Um, again, you get this perfect passive of hypothesia. The, in other words, that word submitted in verse... Uh, At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Okay? Suddenly, the author switches it around. Right? Because we talked about how this word submission or subjection or subjugation, right, has been the active form. He's really hammering this home. This is 
forceful, that, that God did this. And then you get here to verse 8 at the end where he says, at present we do not yet see everything passively in submission to him. And it's a perfect passive. In other words, it's a, everything has not yet submitted itself and continuing to submit itself. This is uh, you know, one of those words where it's talking about something that needs to happen, and that thing that happens needs to have, has an ongoing effect. Notice we haven't gotten there yet. The world has not submitted itself there. Okay? The other thing to note here as well is the word see. We do not yet glimpse, briefly catch sight of. This first word see is a different word than in verse 9 where it says, but we see him. Okay? The first word is hararo, which is very much a, a brief, fleeting glimpse. You know, we perceive it, but we just haven't been able to stare at it. We notice it, but we're really not sure what we just saw. Okay? We do not yet glimpse everything in subjection to him. And yet, then the next word in chapter 9, but we see him. See, look at, observe, pay especially close attention to something. Him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Yeah. And so, we don't see this, and yet, we have this, this huge way of seeing Christ and what Christ has already done. In other words, now and not yet. This has been fulfilled. And that's when Christ did it. We, we observed it. We watched it. We paid especially close attention to it. And yet, we haven't gotten that final fulfillment when Christ comes back and we can see the full ultimate revelation of God on earth. Okay. We're going to stop there because we're out of time. But any questions up through verse 9? So we don't have a complete fulfillment yet, uh, as we were saying, and not everything has a subjection. But it will be, because mm -hmm. Revelation says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is born. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Jesus himself says very similar things. You know, well, it's good. <laughs> he, he speaks in Revelation as well, but I think even in the Gospels, he talks about how, you know, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, all this other stuff. This is what the birth pains, right? You know, it's still coming. It's still coming. There is, you know, hope at the end. And yet, don't let that diminish the reality of the now. Christ is here now. But the final fulfillment of that promise has yet to occur. Yeah, that's this now and not yet. It's, it's a powerful way to view things, especially if you're looking at the, the New Testament and the kingdom of God on earth and, and all the stuff, you know, when we baptize you know, babies or adults, or when we take the Lord's Supper, or when, you know, you hear God's forgiveness, you know, as I forgive your sin, or, or you yourselves forgive sins of those around you, you know, that's your glimpse, your fleeting glance of what you'll get to observe in its entirety at the new heavens and the new earth. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. It should be, right? <laughs> Yeah. Any other comments or questions before we close? All right, well, let us close. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you have sent your Son, who is greater than angels, who is the ultimate fulfillment of your purpose for man. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to observe his kingdom come. Come quickly, O oh Lord, in your name we pray. Amen.